She's the only person that didn't fight with the angel when the angel showed up and said, <laughs> okay, a great thing is about to happen. I think Latter-day Saints shoot ourselves in the foot because whenever we speak Holly and Mary, that's seen as Catholic or false. Mm. And it's kind of my hope, like Latter-day Saints will actually have a great respect of what the scriptures, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and other teachings of the church say about Mary to actually have a more balanced view of the mother of Jesus. How do we make Mother Mary more important? I feel like kind of like doctrinally, we thread that needle very, very well, but maybe not culturally. Now, everyone has a Mariology. Um, of course, you mentioned they're Catholic and Eastern Orthodox friends. They have a very high Mariology. Yeah, like maybe in an effort to be like, we're different from Catholics. We've thrown Mary aside more than we should. Since, since we're not Protestants, we don't need to protest the Catholics. We didn't break off from the Catholics. We can just go with what's actually in the scriptures, ancient and later, you know, restoration, right? Um, and what they I say feel about like Mary and give her her proper place. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I'm your host, Cardinal. I'm joined in the studio by Kwaku L, Don Bradley, and Brad Whitbeck. And we also are joined via the Zoom machine by Robert Boylan, okay? Yeah. The coolest Scotsman that uh, the world has ever seen. Uh, LDS Church's favorite... Um, William Wallace. William yeah. Wallace uh -huh. of, uh, of of Mormonism. That Just kidding. haggis-eating <laughs> slasher. Yeah, exactly. He uh, actually... No, no. He's our favorite Irishman, now trapped in Utah, who runs a super cool blog called Scriptural Mormonism that you have to check out and is often referenced by many of our academic buddies. And many people do not know, he was a graduate... He graduated from a Catholic seminary before joining the church Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and has an important message for us. Mariology and why it should matter to your average LDS Latter-day Saint. So, um, Robert, is that a fair intro? And if it is, take it away, bro. Uh, well, I converted doing my studies in uh, a Catholic seminary or institution. But yeah, that's a pretty good. Uh, well, how'd that go over? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> that's a about yeah. Wait, so while you were studying... In a Catholic uh, seminary? In a Catholic institution, yeah. So I wait. wasn't a seminarian, but I was a theology student there. So you're like reverse of that dude in Pints from Aquinas. Oh. Yeah, but I'm much more intelligent than I've <laughs> oh, 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 savage, man. More intelligence and integrity. Yeah. That's brutal, man. That's brutal. You're the coolest Scottish guy I know, man. So anyway, um, no, I'm just kidding. That's going to be a reoccurring thread throughout this podcast. Bro. Just don't call me English and we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's funny. All right. So uh, introduce us to Mariology. You're right. That's kind of a, a doctrine of more of our Catholic brothers and sisters. Many people are not very familiar with it, oftentimes until they serve missions in Europe or in South America, but we know it's a big deal to our Catholic brothers and si sisters with whom we share a deep affinity and love for Jesus Christ. So why don't you just uh, hit us up? Tell us uh, why it's important, what it, what it is, and yeah, knock it out of the park, man. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mariology is basically the theology or study of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, in theology, you have different ologies. You have eschatology, the theology of the end times. You have soteriology and Christology the theology of salvation and Christology, and Mariology, of course, as I said, is the theology about the person work of the mother of Jesus. Now, Wait, so it's theology, not theology? On, on it, it's my pronunciation. Oh, I was thinking I was an idiot for like the first 40 years of my life and that you just, <laughs> like, I learn a new word every day with freaking Don Bradley in the room here. <laughs> and so um, I'm the idiot that also still says etymology instead of entomology, the study of insects. So yeah, I was thinking I was just messed up for four decades there. Robert, you're- oh, no, no, it's my Irish accent. <laughs> yeah, Robert, your voice is so naturally scratchy. Did you eat a bag of mulch before this? Like, <laughs> it is so, you've got like this gravel. It's, uh, it's awesome, you, and I got to tell you, there's- you up to five packs a day now? Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Wait, yeah. you're Irish? It lends credibility. I thought you were Scottish. Yeah. No, he's Irish. We were, we were joking. That's the joke. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. All right. So he is doing a fundraiser for the 501c3 of your choice, however, by uh, recording your voicemail for you. You know what I'm saying? So when people call, they think that you have a cool Irish- uh, you know, office manager or secretary. That'd be kind of cool. So anyway, Robert, hit us. Mariology, go. Yeah, no, everyone has a Mariology. Um, of course, you mentioned they're Catholic and Eastern Orthodox friends. They have a very high Mariology. For instance, yesterday was the Feast of the Dormition or Assumption of Mary, mm. which is a doctrine in mm. Eastern Orthodoxy and a defined dogma 
in Roman Catholicism, which basically means um, it's part of the gospel. And if you reject it, knowingly, you're condemned. But even Latter-day Saints have a Mariology. Um, it's a lore Mariology, but at the same time, um, if one studies what the church and other authors like Bruce McConkie and others have said about Mary, it's actually much more balanced Mariology than simply a very low Mariology right. as many members of the church functionally have. Mm -hmm. uh, to give an example of this, uh, whenever Mary is rarely mentioned in the Book of Mormon, um, but whenever she is, she's spoken highly of. Yeah. Uh, for instance, in 1 Nephi chapter 11, 13 and 15, uh, it says, And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the great city of Jerusalem, and also other cities, and I beheld the city of Nazareth. And in the city of Nazareth I beheld a virgin, that is Mary, and she was exceedingly fair and white. And I said unto him, A virgin most beautiful and fair above all other virgins, when he's described what he saw. And in Alma 7.10, Alma just very briefly says, of the future mother of Jesus, Mary, you know, how she would be a virgin and a precious and chosen vessel. Um, so even like uniquely Latter-day Saint scripture, there is a very high reverence to Mary. It doesn't go into, I would argue, the frankly idolatrous and ahistorical strata of dogmas you find in Rome and Eastern mm. Orthodoxy, but at the same time, Mary is still given respect. And even if you were to read, like say, the works of Bruce McConkie, like the, Millenn the Millennial Messiah and other works, he is very opposed to Roman Catholicism. Mm. But at the same time, he still speaks very highly of Mary, even calling her the Virgin and other uh, titles, um, and even saying that, you know, she was chosen the pre-existence. And most recently, you have Sean Hopkin from BYU, who in a recent essay in the Feshcrift for Stephen D. Ricks, uh, actually argued, as did many early Christians, that Mary is in the order of redemption in New or Second Eve, just as Eve brought about mm -hmm. the fall by her ye uh, saying yes to a fallen angel and oh. so forth. Mary, by her fiat to Gabriel, yeah. uh, actually helped bring Jesus into the world and was an instrumental means of salvation in a very limited respect. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, like as a former Roman Catholic, um, Mariology is very important because Mariology is alongside the uh, veneration of images or icons perhaps in my view, the greatest disproof of Rome's claims to be the one true church. So it's very important when it comes to, say, Catholic and oh. Latter-day Saint dialogue and debate, the apostasy. But at the same time, um, as someone who's been researching Mariology for 19 years now, um, I think Latter-day Saints shoot ourselves in the foot because whenever we speak Holly and Mary, that's seen as Catholic or false. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of my hope, like Latter-day Saints will actually have a great respect of what the scriptures, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and other teachings of the church say about Mary to actually have a more balanced view of the murder of Jesus. So what you're saying is basically having a high opinion of Mary is not a Catholic specific thing, right? It is exactly. something that we should have as Latter-day Saints. And exactly. Yeah. And I, and I was going to say uh, something I really appreciated in my speaking with uh, Joshua after our interaction with him was he, he really appreciated our podcast we did on the holy envy that we had for the church of Jesus Christ bicker tonight. Right. And something I've said in my faith is like, okay, we know the church is not perfect because it is the mortal iteration of the kingdom of God and everything that's on mortal earth is fallen and has flaws. And you know, it's getting there. It's more perfect than other institutions. And the book of Mormon is the most perfect book. Right. But, but nothing down here was perfect except for Jesus Christ. We know there has to be flaws. All right. And then we know there has to be something missing. And I've had a sneaking suspicion. This isn't a doubt, but I believe it cla it's classified as holy envy that, you know, like our bicker tonight brothers that have like this gift of tongues where there's, you know, the gift of tongues and the interpretation, you see how it's practiced there and how it's utilized and venerated. And, and I like that I have holy envy. And then I compare it with kind of like our version of the gift of tongues. Cause we read about it in scripture and every once in a while we talk about it in Sunday school, but people always say like, Oh, well, you know, if you serve a mission you study hard and the Holy ghost accompanies you, you'll get the gift of tongues and you might learn Spanish in six weeks instead of eight weeks. You know, it like, it, it, it's almost like some kind of like mini nitric nitrous oxide you add to some kind of linguistic academic pursuit. <laughs> and I'm like, when I read like the day of Pentecost in the book of acts. Okay. I'm not seeing a, a little additive put in the gas tank. When I read the stories of pioneers, all of a sudden uttering, ju just, just literally uttering Paiute Indian 
to save the lives of some of their family members and and language that they've never languages they've never spoken before. I can turn down the headphones yeah, if you well. want me to turn them down. Okay. Um, when when I see other churches having this gift of tongues being just just this outpouring of the spirit, I'm like, no, that ain't just missionaries learning in six weeks what they should have in eight. All right. And I have that kind of holy envy for other faiths. So I kind of do look at some of these venerations, like in Catholicism, where there there's that deep, profound love for the Virgin Mary. And I think like, okay, cool. We might be missing something here. You know what I'm saying? Like we might be missing something here and Mormons don't do well when they adopt Protestantism and Protestantism does kind of try and strip a lot of those things that they fought against Catholics for a century on. And I think maybe we got to bring that back a little bit, Brad. Yeah. Like maybe in an effort to be like, we're different from Catholics. We've thrown Mary aside more than we should. So can I, if I could jump in there. So, whoa, whoa, look, look, so, Don, Don, no. Don, you look, come on. So, uh, what, you think you're going to run roughshod on a podcast here? <laughs> no, it's, yes. So, What's going so, on, bro? Father Boylan, I mean, Robert. Um, <laughs> so um, I, one perspective that I would have on Catholicism plays on that uh, comment we just had, that um, Protestantism, if you look at Protestantism, look at the name. Protestant protest, right? So Protestantism is formed as a sort of protest movement against Catholicism. So if you look at how Protestants self-identify, how they define themselves, there's always this this boogeyman of the Catholic Church in the background in their self-definition. So mm. sola scriptura is really an, a, a way of rejecting the authority of the Catholic Church by locating all authority solely in the Bible. Mm. But then, of course, they come up with an issue like, well, where did we get the Bible? Who put that Bible together? It's like a self-assembling Bible. It, I, it assembled itself on its own authority. Like, there was no church that put it together. Right? Are well, you suggesting that the that creeds might just be an accidental abomination and that Sola Scriptura is one of the most historical copes known to all <laughs> mankind in all time? So just th there's there's this reaction against each other. That was right? a very like, euphemistic like defined yes. By, <laughs> defined by reaction, right? So Latter-day Saints don't necessarily need to define themselves against Catholics, although many early Latter-day Saints did. They picked up the anti-Catholic Protestant idea from their Protestant upbringing. They imported it into the Restoration, so in the Book of Mormon, in uh, Nephi's vision, where he sees uh, Mary, um, we have the phrasing that in our modern Book of Mormon text that Mary was the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. And in the earliest text, we have it saying she was the mother of God after the manner of the flesh. So I have looked up the phrase mother of God in books in Google Books, right, from the early 1800s. And from what I can find, it is used exclusively by Catholics. Protestants do not use this phrase. Mm. And yet the Book of Mormon, even though it's emerging in a Protestant context where the, the guy translating it, the guy transcribing it, the witnesses to it, the, the members of the church who are spreading it, they're all from a Protestant background. And yet it has what one would otherwise think is Catholic phrasing, cath Catholic theology, mm. if you will, in the book that gives this higher view of Mary that ascribes to her a title that the Protestants did not want to ascribe to her because they're reacting against the Catholic high vision of Mary. So they have this very low vision of Mary. And yet the Book of Mormon is giving this higher vision of Mary by far than the Protestants have. So yeah, why I agree. In fact, like early critics of the uh, church, especially from other restorationist groups, argued the Book of Mormon was Romanist because of the reference to Mary as mother of God. Oh, wait, wait. Some of our earliest critics said we were Romanists? Yeah. I will accuse the Book of Mormon of Roman, was uh, Romanism Alexander in Campbell light of Mary or, being called mother of God. Was it Alexander Campbell? Or yeah, he would be it, one yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we make Mother Mary more important? Well, kind of realizing that let it be. She was yeah. <laughs> let it well, be. She was the mother of Jesus. Um, I don't know what it's like in the states, but like in Ireland, uh, you don't diss someone's mom, and we're talking about the mother of Jesus. Mm. And if you were to read, like, say, 
even people who were unfortunately sometimes very anti-Catholic, like Bruce McConkie, he had a very high view of Mary. He, mm -hmm. uh, he believed that she was foreordained to be the mother of the Messiah from the pre-existence. And I, I don't think you can get a higher Mariology than that. And the very fact that she had this singularly unique role in salvation history to provide, alongside God the Father, the humanity of Jesus, which without the humanity of Jesus, there'd be no atoning sacrifice. Um, she plays a very important, albeit secondary, instrumental um, mm. ca um, cause in salvation. To so what do we got to do, my man? So like, uh, uh, what's the call to arms? What's the call to action? Should we all start writing letters? Or get small statues of her? Yeah, and put get them in our, yeah, just <laughs> in our uh, I think there would be no reaction. My own view would be not to shy away from Mary, not to mention her owning, passing in Christmas and Easter and to realize she like with Peter, is a very great example, albeit fallible, of an apostle in the New Testament. I mean, if you look at how she's depicted in the Gospels, mm -hmm. um, the very first time we see her in the Gospel of Luke, she, um, an angel, Gabriel, appears to her and calls her highly favored one, the Greek kikartomene. Uh, it does not mean full of grace, contrary to Catholics, but be it, be, it's still an angelic creation. Uh, she's called blessed among all women um, by Elizabeth later in that very same chapter. Um, and although she's fallible, at times she doesn't understand the mission of Jesus as seen in Luke 2, she is faithful to the very end until the last time we see her, and that's in Acts 1.14, on the, um, when the Holy Spirit descends on the church, um, shortly after the mm -hmm. resurrection of Christ mm -hmm. and his ascension. So, and if you look at how the very earliest Christians like Irenaeus and Justin and others um, understood her, they would apply the title of New Year's Second Eve to her. Um, that's not a statement that she was immaculately conceived as some Catholics and others believe it to be, but that she played, just as Eve played a detrimental role with Adam in bringing about uh, condemnation, mm. she played a instrumental role in some sense with Christ in bringing about redemption. Uh, and you can see mm. that in like Irenaeus circa 180 in his book Against Heresies. So once the Day Saints can re realize it's not wrong to speak highly of Mary or to give talks on Mary or to focus on Mary as an example of apostleship um, or what it means to be a disciple of Christ and so forth. Um, I think we can get over that hurdle. Right. And since, since we're not Protestants, we don't need to protest the Catholics. We didn't break off from the Catholics. We mm -hmm. don't need yeah. to react against the fact that Catholics may in some ways have too high a view of Mary or, yeah. or address adoration to Mary or whatever. We can just go with what's actually in the scriptures, ancient and latter, you know, restoration, right? Um, and what they I say feel about like, Mary and give her her proper place. Yeah, I feel like kind of like doctrinally, we thread that needle very, very well, but maybe not culturally. You know what I'm saying? Doctrinally, I feel like we really have a deep respect. I've I've seen lots of lessons that have said, you know, Mary, the chosen vessel of the Lord. And and I, I've seen lots of great lessons. She's always referenced when it talks about ob obedience to God's commandments because she so famously said, you know, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. She's the only person that didn't fight with the angel when the angel showed up and said, <laughs> OK, a great thing is about to happen to you. You're going to have a great prophet born to you. The son of God is going to be born to you. Oh, you know, uh, you'll have seed like endless stars in the heavens and stuff. The only one that didn't fight with the angel giving her the good news was freaking Mary. So I, I've seen some really great talks and speeches and doctrinal dissertations and 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 quotes and references uh, doctrinally given really uh, speaking very highly of Mary. But culturally, you're right. We don't we don't really have why well, I have that a, that culture. I get a question, Robert. Do you think that throughout history, the apparitions of Mary when they in different countries, do you think that was legit. Like, do you think God gave her the okay and said, "Yeah, go, go up here no. to these people"? Oh no, I uh, know. Uh, I don't believe um, if it was supernatural. I say it was demonic, but I don't believe Mary, the mother of Jesus, appeared in Fatima in 1917 or Lourdes in 1858. Uh, for one reason, the theology this uh, being taught. Um, for instance, in 1858, she reaffirmed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, and in 1917, that alongside the Rosary, which purportedly she gave in a vision in the year 1214 to Dominic, the founder of the Dominican Order. So just based on the theology... Oh, I when you say Immaculate Conception, that means that yeah. she was... she conceived... No. 
Oh no, that's she, that she herself of her immaculate was conceived conception. Without so Urshan Catholics sin. have a and dual doctrine Urshan. when it comes to this. Yeah, there's the virgin birth, right. right, which is that Jesus was born without miraculously without a father. But then the Immaculate Conception is saying Mary herself, from her conception, had been freed from original sin. All other human, all other humans suffer from original sin, mm. but she was from conception free from original sin, oh. so that she could be a pure vessel through which God could come into the world. Okay. Because otherwise, that. otherwise he would inherit the stain of original sin. Yeah. yeah. So, and, so, and that was, and just, and that was defined December eight, eighteen fifty four. So it's pretty recent. Its definition by Pius the Ninth. And wow. you also don't believe in that Latter Day Saint should pray to Mary or pray, ask her to pray for us. No, I don't. Um, well, I think that's pretty uh, again, uh, solidly agreed I, upon in Scripture. <laughs> I cut. I'm not saying we should. I kind of wish we had communion of saints in our church. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, it's interesting when you look at like how ancestors are involved. In I think and, I wish we had it. I wish yeah, we had well, it. Well, okay. You almost took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to say, okay, besides Mariology, I think we've kind of covered that, what it is, how it might be useful to culturally expand our um, recognition of Mary and stuff. I would love to hear Robert Boylan's story, A, of his conversion while studying theology in a Catholic institution. That's incredible. Yeah. But like, are, is there anything else in Catholicism that you really kind of experience holy envy on that you think like we would do well for my old faith tradition adopting some of these cultural practices that are indeed doctrinally sound? See, because now that I can't watch Pints with Aquinas because he's calling for the burning of Book of Mormon books, Nazi <laughs> style, which wouldn't be the yeah, first time that, that guy Catholics- was really cool. Cool, and then one day became a douche. Yeah, and just like, like what happened? I, he just decided to be like the pope that helped smuggle out the Nazis before. You know what I'm saying? Uh, anyway, uh, what? To, to, to be fair, I think some people are really cringing. Really? But also, Robert, nobody wants to debate you. Everyone talks crap, and then the comps are always debate Robert <laughs> Boylan, and they always to, back to, out. To be to be fair, uh, I know you're gonna get like a Lutheran guy. Um, Hi, Travis. Uh, complain in the comments section, but actually, to be fair, there are two people who are willing to debate me. Uh, one, actually, they're both Catholic. Uh, one is Peter Dumish, who's actually in Utah. We're, we mm. will be debating later this year the Immaculate mm. Conception of Mary. Oh. And Trent Horn has agreed to debate me. We really? just have to hash out the uh, wow. topic of the debate. Okay. Okay. And finally. And we'll make sure we get you some good lighting for that debate, you know? So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And a microphone. You know what I'm saying? So that might be nice. Anyway, if anyone if anyone wants to drop some uh, mood on my way, uh, there's a GoFundMe. So. Yeah, <laughs> God, link to that in the description. But, but but just in terms of like holy envy, to get back to your question, um, yeah, there's some topics uh, and some teams that I think Larry Saints, including myself, who's rather critical of Rome, uh, should have holy envy for. Like, mm. uh, I, I have holy envy for like the very high liturgy of the Trinity Mass. Mm. Um, I wish we had a high liturgy. Uh, even in the temple, it's kind of stripped mm. down in recent years. I kind of wish we had a high liturgy. You're and one, also like a much more, more higher incense? reverence for the Eucharist <laughs> or the sacrament when it's being celebrated as well. Uh, that's true. I, I have holy envy for that as well. Yeah, you know, we, 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 we do kind of, we've truncated things a lot. And I think in some ways that's been good. It, it's made uh, accessibility to the worship services higher. But, you, you, you know, the depth, the depth is not there. And there, there is a balance. Obviously, there is a balance. And I, I trust that the people who are making these decisions are wholly decent in every way and are consulting with the Lord in that process. But, you know, there is some things that you miss, man. You yeah, know what I'm I, I, I feel like the the symbolism is still there if you look for it. But some of these high liturgy things that you're talking about, um, Robert, I think give you this level of respect for those ordinances that like separates it even further from the world, well, you and, know? Yeah, and a level of respect for God. So one thing we are mm. great at as Latter-day Saints, and I speak as someone who has been a Latter-day Saint and who has been a non-Latter-day Saint, right? Uh, both. He calls know, those eight, the eight. very dark years for which he is ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> but no. <laughs> and, and I, we all I, love I, you, Don. Have, Don't pay attention. I have been an atheist. I have been a Baha'i. I have been a non-Latter-day Saint Christian, and I have been, an, obviously, a Latter-day Saint, and am. Latter-day Saint. Um, so one of the great things that we have in the Restoration is this sense of familiarity with God, right? Like the sense of familial closeness. God yeah. is my heavenly Father. I, I have this very, I have this real parental sense with God. I approach God very much as my Father, and I have that feeling of affection in that way. 
Um, I think that often, though, in Catholicism and sometimes in other um, traditional Christian denominations, there is a level of awe toward God, a level of reverence mm. toward God's transcendence, and therefore, perhaps going along with that, a, a natural level of sort of praise of God, you know, that we could use more of in the Restoration. Yeah. I mean, dude, I'm down. So, so, um, what else though? Like what other things besides, okay. Just, cause, cause I got to tell you, I like wafers I, for sacrament bread. Yeah. Wa wafers for sacrament. Bread. I, I, I have my thing, something that I love. I love about Catholics, the deep beauty and the, the, the tradition, the artifacts, the veneration, like, like that's just, it is so gorgeous, and I really kind of feel like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only other tradition that builds cathedrals. You know what I'm saying? Mm. We just call them temples, mm. you know? And 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 it's, it's really us or the Catholics when it comes to that kind of thing, and I just think it's absolutely beautiful. So when they're not threatening to burn our books, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I just, I really can hang out with these guys, <laughs> and you know, I can, I can really like them. It's not hard for me, just, 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 just you know like just keep it out of the fire brother out of the fire you know so um tell me what about our church in comparison to the doctrine that you were regularly studying and used to made you come over to our side of the equation man like i, I we only got 10 minutes left here I, I i wish we had more but um what what was it because you know that's 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 a pretty big ask well, ultimately, uh, what happened was I got a spiritual witness about the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith, um, and that's what pushed me over. Uh, and that's basically the foundation of why I'm a Latter-day Saint. But in terms of, say, theology, uh, you know, there's certain aspects of theology that Latter-day Saints have that other groups don't have that, frankly, I'm convinced is biblical and historical. For instance, um, that God the Father is embodied and he has a three-dimensional form. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's overwhelming biblical uh, even, and even um, extra biblical evidence for that. Yeah. Um, you also have the idea of posthumous salvation. That's a technical term for salvation for the dead, which is very early Christian as well. Um, and you have another other doctrines as well, like the relationship between faith, grace, and works in our basic theology. Funny enough, I, it's actually pretty close to the Catholic view, but it's mm. anathema to Protestantism because there's no room for imputed righteousness and um, justification only be the legal declaration. And there's, there's a host of other topics as well, um, such as the high view of humanity and the question of the unevangelized and the question of, well, what happens to infants who die? Uh, that's a burning question for centuries that's yeah. been going on as well. All right, dude, that is freaking awesome, bro. So you just I, I get the, you you kind of convert you just got your witness of the book of mormon and joseph smith and everything like that but what what was the instigating factor that made you even interested yeah what like mm. what what takes a guy who's just hardcore studying his catholic institution there there's plenty to study over there what would make you what, think was I, it, was it I mean you're not me? you're not grabbing the <laughs> bhagavad gita you know what i'm saying like what's what what's going on what what interested you what was the spark uh, basically, I was challenged by a Muslim friend of mine to study other groups, um, oh, and really? I decided to study different, and I came across, like, say, the church and other groups like the Christadelphians and others. Oh, wow. um, when it comes to Mormonism, I was intrigued by the idea of, like, a restoration and apostasy, and I managed to track down a copy of the Book of Mormon. Um, the the branch in my hometown was being next to a shoe shop, so I couldn't actually find it for a while. Um, it was pretty obscure. But I found a 1920 copy of the Book of Mormon, and I decided to read it and study it, and I came across Jeff Lindsay and firms and other groups as well mm. um, while I was studying the text. And that's basically the impetus of um, how I became interested in the Book of Mormon and Latter-day Saint theology and basically how I got my spiritual witness. It was mm. just true out. Okay, that's awesome. Unfortunately, we're going to have to go here in a second. This is just going to be for overtime bonus materials for the members. Who was your first interaction with a member of a church? of this church what what was it did you just email the missionaries and two geeks from kaysville showed up or like what was the deal um 
I think my first interaction with the church was actually emailing either Jeff Lindsay or Fair um, some questions I had. Oh, no, it was John Tretnas, the late John Tretnas. He mm -hmm. was my first uh, interaction with a church member. So you just got some scholar at the end of one of these like, oh, <laughs> what? Wow, um, dude. All right, man. That's like freaking crazy. Well, um, I'm, uh, dude, I could sit here and I could talk to you for hours, but... Um, one of the things I would love to do with you is um, lay out the framework of the great apostasy. I know that we'd um, corresponded uh, previously about kind of really trying to map that out and see, you know, exactly how it happened, where it happened, what doctrines were lost in what centuries. Tell me, this is the last thing I'll say. This is our outro here. I had a stake president once who taught the most amazing religions of the world class in all of his travels as somebody who was a head of a major financial institution based out of New York. This is when I lived in New York City. Um, he had had a chance to pray with every major religious head of the Baha'i of uh, he prayed with the Dalai Lama, with the Pope, you know, every major world religion. He was able to pray with w one of their caliphs, one of their popes, one of their big priests, whoever. With Denver right? snuffer. Uh, yeah, with Denver Snuffer, who didn't exist then yet. This was 2009. But um, anyway, one of the things he said when we were talking about, you know, religions, the world, when we got to Catholics was he says, I do believe the great apostasy happened, but it happened a little bit later than others think in some remote areas. He says he thinks the truth of the gospel was preserved for longer. And he had a theory um, of who the last person to hold the original priesthood of of Christ as passed through the apostles, like before it fell, do you have any theories on, on, on who the last person to have held the truth of the original church Christ set up was? Cause he had his, do you have any of your own? Not a specific individual, but I do believe God took the priesthood away around the third century. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is the third century guy, St. Nicholas. He thinks St. Nicholas the was guy who punched Arius. The, uh, yeah. well, Santa Claus. Yeah, yes, but he, yeah, he punched guy. Arius. Yeah. Oh, he, that's awesome. He punched Arius. Who's what? Arius? Yeah, during, during the Council of Nicaea, he decked Arius. <laughs> he just got cooler. Why he, did he, he do that? He thought Arius was insulting the the character of God in really? his arguments. How so? Uh, Arius believed there was a time when Jesus did not exist. Uh, that led to the Arian controversy that was settled, uh, at least in an ecumenical level at year 325 of the first council. Here's a whole new thumbnail for a different day. We're going to get you back. But did Santa Claus punch Arius? Like that is freaking hilarious. That According is awesome. some reports he did. By the way, you, you know, you know, you're an academic when someone brings up St. Nicholas and your first thought isn't Santa. It's, oh, the guy who punched Darius at the <laughs> council. of <laughs> like, yeah, he's <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, well, how can people find you, my man? I, I, I got to tell you, I can vouch his blog. It's the ugliest thing on the Internet. <laughs> it looks like a freaking Boy Scout project done by a 14 year old getting his Internet merit badge. Normally, so it's okay. But but <laughs> it's the biggest wealth of information and is one of the funnest things to read you are a savage both in person and in print my friend and i love your blog uh, how can people that are interested in reading more of your stuff find you and contact you uh, yeah sure uh, the blog is scriptural mormonism.blogspot.com that's also i also run a podcast called scriptural mormonism so you can find me there and i also work for the bh roberts foundation uh so you can track down our materials at mormonor.org as well okay for those of you that didn't get his scottish pronunciation all right it's <laughs> scriptural mormonism all right and dare means there and he also <laughs> works for the bh roberts foundation so um thanks a lot my man You're one of the My coolest pleasure. guys in cyberspace. We will get you back soon. Keep the conversation. We can do this in person. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You're welcome in the studio anytime. Uh, keep the comments going. I uh, sorry. Keep the conversation going in the comments, guys. And don't forget, you can always check out more at wardradio.com. Right.